weakness and through it that your strength would be made known and perfected. And so, Lord, speak tonight through the foolishness of preaching and through this may souls be drawn irresistibly to you, the God of grace and glory. Help us now, we pray, for we ask these mercies in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Have you ever been in that situation where you're, you're going to meet somebody for the first time and there's a certain unease about what they're going to be like? You're not really quite sure. Uh, that's bad enough, perhaps, if you're just going to meet somebody or visit them. But if you're being asked to work with somebody or asked to trust somebody or you're being forced into some kind of relationship where this is going to be ongoing or you're to go and ask them for, for help perhaps. You really want to know what they're like. You want to know whether or not uh, it's going to make it easier to uh, go and ask them if they are of a certain disposition towards you. The Lord tells us to turn to him to apply to him for help and that is the message that comes to Israel through the prophet Joel that they are to return or to repent and seek the Lord and the big question is well if and when we do what will we find if I come to God having sinned against him which is the case here for Israel they've offended God he's displeased of course, the backdrop is here, just to refresh our minds. There's been some massive uh, locust plague that has ravaged the land of Israel. Uh, that comes through in chapter 1. And the various stages of the life of a locust. Uh, if you're having trouble sleeping tonight, um, you can read about the various stages of the life cycle of a locust. Um, I'm sad enough to be interested in that kind of thing. That's my background but that vaguely interests me it probably doesn't do but there you are there you are and uh, you've got the different stages there depicted in chapter one but it means that the whole land every piece of vegetation has been gnawed away there's nothing left and that calamitous event is seized upon by the prophet under god's direction to say look what's happened calamity has come the land's devastated but this is nothing compared to another judgment by God, the day of the Lord, a day of even more pronounced and catastrophic events for God's people and for people in general, because the day of judgment is coming. And this is Joel's point, that these times of national consequence, we would call them national disaster, should cause us to think spiritually and to think ahead in time to the day of judgment because one day we're all going to stand before God and from the human perspective from the perspective of the sinner that's an evil day that's a terrible day it's not a good day it's not a day to be laughed about it's not a day to be joked about it's a terrible day a frightening dreadful day and so in light of this warning that God is angry that God is grieved with their sin that God is full of wrath and judgment and indignation against sin. The call comes, turn to the Lord with all your heart. But if you turn to an angry God, what are you going to find? Are you going to find anger? Are you going to find wrath and judgment and accusation? Are you going to find God pointing the finger at you, listing your sins and telling you just how thoroughly wicked you are and how miserably you have failed and how many uh, of God's commandments you've broken and how much you owe to him. Are you going to turn to him only for God to cast you away? And this is perhaps the fear of the sinner. And there's no incentive there, if you like, to turn. If in turning, I'm going to be damned anyway, well, then what's the point? And this is why the Lord says here what he says through the prophet. And what we are told in verse 13 and 14 is really an inducement to repentance. The Apostle Paul will pick this up in Romans chapter 2 
when he makes this statement that the goodness of God leads to repentance. The goodness of God leads to repentance. It's not the terror of God that leads to repentance. <clears throat> and yet, there is something of that within repentance that we, we see the, the frightening reality that if we go on in our sin, we're going to be condemned by God. We need to turn from that which is leading us downwards into hell and destruction. But the inducement to turn to God, there's, so there's, a, there's a, a frightening reality that would get us to turn away from our sin. But what's the inducement tonight to turn towards God? It is the knowledge of who it is that you will find when you turn to him. What will you find? Well, God tells us this. Turn unto the Lord your God. Verse 13, this is, For he is gracious and merciful slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. There's just four things there to think about this evening in the time that remains with God's help. Four characteristics or features of God that should encourage you tonight if you haven't already, if you're still in your sin, to turn to God in repentance because this is who you'll find if you do. And also for those who are already believers. Because here's a message to what was in the day of Joel the church. Who had backslidden and who had strayed. And if there is any coldness of heart in our hearts. Any backsliding in our own hearts. Here's a word to us. To turn to the Lord with confession. What are we going to find? Because even the Christian sometimes thinks if I turn to God. God's not going to be happy with me because I should have known better. Yes, you should have. And you do. But you're not going to find one who is hostile and unwilling to show mercy. You will find one who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. So here's the inducement to repentance. God is willing to show mercy and grace, and not to judge, but to bless. So we read here, first of all, that God is gracious and merciful. He's gracious and merciful. Sometimes when people are applying for a job or a position or filling in certain forms, they're asked those horrible questions um, to explain or to write down what your strengths are, or what your positive points are, or what your weaknesses are, or those kinds of things. There's some weird psychology going on in there uh, when you read what people put down. Um, is it that when people write lots of good things about themselves, the psychology is, well, they're, they're proud, they're a bit overconfident, uh, they're not honest. And somebody else writes lots of negative things about themselves, and you say, well, they lack self-esteem and so on. Who knows how to write those things in a way that's you're trying to get inside the mind of the person asking the question. You're trying to second guess. We might not be always straightforward and honest. We might not always know how to present ourselves. What am I really like to other people? We've all got an idea of what we are like. And then somebody else comes along and tells us that we're not quite as we thought we were or are. And they see us in a different light. But God knows himself. And God won't under value himself God and I, I say it reverently but in light of the way people think God doesn't suffer from a, a lack of self esteem but neither is God proud and arrogant and vain God reveals himself as he is he's not dressing things up in order to get us to do something that he wants us to do God tells it straight and I say all of that because that great man, Moses, had an interesting desire. He wanted to see and to know God. Not a bad desire, was it? Not a bad interest. I want to know God. I wonder, is that the interest of your heart? Is that the thing that you want more than anything else? I want to know God. And more than that, I want to see God. I want to be with God. That's where Moses really was. He wanted to see God, to know the glory of God. 
And this is his, his cry. And God says, well, okay, I'm going to cause my glory to pass before you. And you'll see, God says, my back parts. What happened on that occasion? What, what was the experience of this man when he asks to know about God? Well, we read in Exodus 34 and the verse uh, well, 5 and 6, verse 5 tells us that the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. God declares himself to Moses. So how does Moses understand God? How does he know God? What does he see of the glory of God? What is the essence of the glory of God? Well, the essence is this. God proclaims himself. They pass by before him and proclaim the Lord, Jehovah Jehovah God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. God declared who he is. And at the head of all of those different features, God says that he is merciful and gracious. So the word order is switched around. It's inverted. But it's the same expression that we have here in Joel uh, 2 verse 13. Gracious and merciful. Indeed, there are other component parts there. Long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth and who forgives iniquity and transgression. That's God. That's who he is. And we've got other expressions in the scripture that remind us, for example, that God is love. And yes, we, we don't emphasize one, one characteristic of God or one feature against another. God is holy. God is, God is light. God is truth. All of these characteristics. But it is interesting that when God declares himself, he says, this is who I am. I am merciful and I am gracious. And in doing that, and in causing us to see that and to know that and to understand that, it forms the basis of God saying, seek my face, turn to me. So again, in another scripture, not unlike what we have in Joel chapter 2, this time in Second Chronicles chapter 7, uh, the word of God comes to, to Solomon. And it's it's given in the context of uh, if things happen, especially in the life of Israel, in their national life, when calamity strikes, or if there's judgment, if there's some pestilence that's sent among them on the basis of their sin, God says this to the king to pass it on to the people. And here we have it in the word of God tonight. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And this is the point that God is, is making that if people, his people, will seek his face, then they will find one who is willing to do what? To forgive. Because he is full of grace and he is merciful. And over and over and again you've got that in the scriptures. And just to, to make one further point about this before we move on. Again, in the prophecy of Jonah, uh, you've got this expression uh, given. Uh, and Jonah understands the nature and the character of God. And it's a strange thing in the life of Jonah because... He's annoyed and he's upset by this. We read in Jonah 4, it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was very angry. Now what would make Jonah angry? What would upset him so much? Well, the last verse of chapter 3 of Jonah was this. And God saw their works, that's the works of the people of Nineveh, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry, and he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, 
Was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. I know what you're like. I know that you're gracious and merciful. I know that you forgive sinners. I know that when people repent, you show them mercy. I know that you won't judge them when they turn to you for forgiveness. And that's annoyed him. That's a whole different uh, sermon than the one we're thinking about tonight. But here's the point. Here's a man who knew the character of God. That if sinners turn to him, what will they find? They will find a God who is full of mercy, full of grace, and he will abundantly pardon. And the point simply is tonight, if you turn to the Lord as a sinner, confessing your sin and your wickedness, you'll not find God standing there ready just to strike you down in a moment. God is abounding in degrees and depths of mercy and grace that we can't begin to understand. I said that was the last point in that note. Let me just add this in. Moses asked to see the glory of God. The Lord Jesus Christ, in John 1, it's recorded that no man has seen God at any time. Um, that Moses didn't even look upon the face of God truly, but we're told there in John 1 that the only begotten of the Father, he hath declared him. In other words, the Lord Jesus Christ reveals God to us. And who or what is the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, he is the one who has brought grace to us. He is the one through, who, through his earthly ministry, has made it abundantly clear that he pardons sinners. That he came to seek and to save the lost. He entertained the tax collectors that were the offscouring of society in Israel, that were hated and despised and loathed and treated as the lowest of the low. If they were on fire, people wouldn't spit on them, they would treat their dog better. Jesus Christ came and he saved people like that. Jesus Christ saved the hypocritical Pharisees that turned to him. Jesus Christ prayed, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. He was full of grace and truth. And that's what you will find when you turn to God in repentance, confessing your sin to him. He's not there. He doesn't stand tonight. He doesn't invite you to come to him in order that he can just cast you away and take some pervert, perverted glee in casting you into hell. The Lord himself tells us that he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. His desire, his interest is that you would repent and that you would turn and that you would live. So he's gracious and merciful. The second expression here is that he is slow to anger. Or, as it's expressed elsewhere, that God is long-suffering. He suffers long. It takes a long time to really weary God. Aren't we thankful tonight that that's the case? That God's a lot more patient with us than we are with him. Than we are with ourselves than we are with one another. God suffers a whole lot more at our hands than any of us suffer at the hands of anybody else. And God is long suffering. And he puts up with a lot. He's slow to anger. And it's interesting that this idea of being slow to anger, it's anger of in a sense any kind or any amount or any degree of anger. See, with us, it's possible, isn't it, that we might not get angry over one thing, but we might get angry over something else. Um, I always remember a teacher uh, at school, and he was a, a, an interesting character. He certainly was a character, um, a chemistry teacher, and uh, I'm sure he's, I don't know, he might still be living, I don't know, somewhere, but he was, uh, I, I liked him. Uh, for all of his eccentricity, but he, the thing I always I found bizarre about him was that there were certain things that boys did in, in no boys' school, and you can imagine what that was like, and uh, mischief making and whatnot, and being disruptive in class was just uh, 
the order of the day. But the thing that always confused me about him was that there were certain things that I thought would upset and make him angry that did everybody else, but he just didn't seem to care. And he breezed through and didn't bother. But the things that did annoy him and wind him up were just bizarre. And he thought, well, that don't make any sense. And you, you weren't quite sure. And then, of course, then there'd be another teacher and a different thing would upset them and annoy them and rile them. The expression here that's slow to anger, the anger that's in view, has the idea that it's, it's any kind or any number of angers. It's all the things about us that could make God angry. We might think to ourselves, well, okay, God's not going to be angry about this thing or that thing. But there's another thing about me. There's another thing that I've done, and God will be angry about that. God won't be patient with me about this particular issue, this particular sin. But the expression here tells us that he's slow to anger right across the board. Anger that would come from some part of God's offended character and nature. God is slow to anger. Why does God tell us that? Because in our minds, God is going to be swift to punish me. God's not going to put up with my failures for too long. And maybe I have crossed that line. Maybe I have exhausted God's patience. But God is slow to anger. And I think it's an, it's an interesting expression as well because it doesn't say that God will never be angry. God's patience can be exhausted. We do know that. And Peter picks up on that when he challenges what, what the unbeliever and the ungodly assess from God having not come in judgment. Because they say, well, well, where's the sign of God's coming? If God were real, God would do this and God would do that and God would do the other thing. That's what people say, isn't it? If God was really God, why doesn't he do this? Why doesn't he step into time? Why doesn't he do things? And of course, they, sadly, they express their own foolishness. Because God has stepped into time in the person of Jesus Christ. But they also show that they don't understand the nature and the character of God, that God is long-suffering, that he gives space to repent to humanity, that he gives men and women and individuals and nations space to turn to him. But one day he is going to return, and he is going to judge the world, and this world is going to be consumed with fire. But he gives space. <clears throat> And he gives a gracious invitation to sinners to turn because his anger hasn't reached its full measure, if you like, now. And now is the day of salvation. Now is the time. And we understand that that is true because the very nature of Joel's prophecy and his ministry is this day is coming. It's in the future, but it's coming. It's drawing nearer and it's closer today than it was yesterday. And God is exhorting you to repent of your sin and turn to him. But don't keep on pushing God back. Don't keep pushing the boundaries, as it were, of God's long suffering. But we, as we come to him, as we're encouraged to come to him, can say that God will suffer long with us. The third expression that's used here is that God is of great kindness. That he is of great kindness. That could be expressed or translated in different ways. God is exceedingly loving. Or God's acts of kindness are great or plenteous. That he's abundant in his goodness. He's plenteous in mercy. Or you could speak about the multitude of his loving kindnesses. It shows just how great God is in his goodness. And that kindness and the faithfulness of God is it's foundational to God's character. This idea of the loving kindnesses of God is expressed repeatedly in Psalm 136. Now, psalm 136 is a psalm that gives us some degree of legitimacy for having hymns with a chorus. Because Psalm 136 has very brief verses followed by a chorus which is repeated over and over again. We'll give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth 
forever. O give thanks unto the God of gods, for his mercy endureth forever. O give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endureth forever. And if I read the uh, remaining 23 verses, we can all guess how they're going to end. For his mercy endureth forever. Repetition's a good thing. Because you're all dull. Let me rephrase that. We are all dull. But we are. We need to hear it over and over again because I forget that. And you forget that. The devil would tempt us to forget it and disbelieve it. The great reality is tonight that God's mercy endureth forever. His loving kindnesses are great. And that is foundational to the character and the actions of of God. It underlies his goodness. And if you go through Psalm 136, you'll see this for yourselves. It supports the unchallenged position of God as God. It's the basis for creation. It's the basis for his redemption and deliverance. It's the reason why God guides his people. It's the reason why he gave to Israel the gift of the land of Canaan. God's loving kindness is the reason why he continued to help them even when they were disobedient. It's the reason for his rule in heaven. We'll give thanks unto the God of heaven for his mercy endureth forever. All that has happened, all that is happening, all that will continue to happen is simply because of God's covenant faithfulness and kindness. God is of great kindness. God is kind. He's kind to us every day. Uh, in ways that we can't begin to imagine. Uh, one of the ways that I, I'm all, it never really ceases to amaze me. Uh, and every time I think about it, I, I'm, I'm still, if you like, blown away. Just the things that are happening in this room right now. That none of us exercise any control over really. That none of us are consciously thinking about. And yet there's a fantastic amount of work going on in this little room tonight amongst us all. Hearts pumping. Lungs being filled and emptied with air. Livers working, kidneys functioning. That great organ of your skin working, your eyes working, your brain processing sights and sounds and just the, the vast array of all of this happening. And none of us are thinking, I must, I must make sure my heart's beating. I have to make sure that I remember to breathe in, out, in, out. Don't think about it. I have to make sure that I get my blood clean. I have to clean my blood at some point today. I have to make sure I get rid of all of those toxins in, in my, my fluids in my body. I must make sure I filter all the water in my body, get rid of all that, that toxic waste and, and get it out. We don't think about it. That's just that's a tiny bit of the goodness of God, that every day God keeps us alive. Moment by moment, God is, is, is maintaining our physical existence, feeding, nurturing, taking care of our bodies. But much more than this, God's God's mercy, God's loving kindness, because God's great kindness is brought to us in, in so many different ways that our heads would start to spin. We would feel overwhelmed. We just have to say, stop, Lord, stop. Because I can't quite take in just the, the degree and the extent and the depths and the variety of all the kindnesses you bring to bear upon me every day. But more than just temporal blessings, it, the great kindness of God is that he's willing to do what? He's willing to show mercy. He's willing to pardon those that come to him and say, I'm a sinner. I have offended you. I need your forgiveness. I need your grace. Lord, save me. God is full of kindness. His mercy forever. And so he says, turn to, to him, turn to the Lord tonight, because you will find great kindness with God. And then perhaps one of the most difficult or troubling expressions that we've got here, probably the most in a way. Because the, the text says that, that he repents him of the evil 
And if you were listening earlier, you'll say, that sounds like something we've heard before. That sounds like what we read of back in Jonah chapter 4, because that's what happened. And that's the record of, of Jonah at the end of chapter 3. God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. A number of things there, can God do evil? Well, it doesn't mean evil uh, as an immoral evil or something that is sin. That's evil as it would appear to us. If you live in a city, and the word comes that that city is going to be overthrown in some way, fire is going to come out of heaven and consume everybody and destroy the city, or there's going to be something that's going to wipe out everybody in the city, a, a disease or an invading army, well, from your perspective, that's evil. It's not good. And so the evil that's spoken of here is from man's perspective, from, from their point of view, destruction is evil. So leave, leaving that to one side then as well, how can it be that God can repent? Because we read elsewhere in the Bible that the Lord doesn't change. So in Malachi we read that I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. <coughs> and that the gifts and callings of God and the election of God is without repentance. So how can God be said to repent? The word could be translated as relent. That may or may not help uh, some people to understand. But the, the point is this, that <coughs> the, the threat, if you like, is Conditional. You might say this is just splitting hairs and you're being a bit pedantic here, but this is the reality. Sometimes there's an absolute threat where it doesn't matter what will happen, the threat is going to be carried out. Sometimes it's a conditional threat. Uh, so the best analogy perhaps we can come up with is the parent-child relationship. Uh, now parents are rubbish at this quite often, aren't they? Uh, if you don't do whatever I'm going to. Now, I've told you, if you don't be quiet, if you don't tidy your room, I'm going to. Now, I've told you, I'm not going to tell you again, which usually means I'm going to tell you another couple of times. <laughs> and you're never going to get to do that again, and I'll never buy you that. And of course, you turn around and do it. Rubbish conditional threats, because they don't get out of mind. Now, why does a parent speak to their children about punishing them if they do something that is wrong? Is it that the parent is sadistic and cruel and unkind and just wants to inflict some kind of punishment? Not unless they're a beast. If they're a loving parent, they make that threat because they want the child to change wrong behaviour. They want to correct them. And they would rather the child listen to the threat and change their behaviour than have to carry out the threat. But the whole intention is to get them to change and to turn. And so if the child does whatever it is that they're being asked to do, you know, bring me my slippers and make me a cup of tea, no, no, clean your bedroom and be respectful and, and all of those things and do the right thing, just be obedient and, and, and good, then there's no risk of punishment. But the whole threat is designed to alert them to what they're doing that is wrong so that they would stop doing it. And that's what God is doing here. He's speaking to people to tell them, you're wrong. You're out of step. The way that you are going is heading to disaster. And if you don't turn, then you will be punished. And so it's a conditional threat. If you don't turn, you will be punished. But the question is, what was God's intention? Well, I would suggest to you that in Nineveh's case, God's intention was always that they would turn. I would suggest further that Noah, uh, Noah, Jonah, was convinced that they would turn. The very moment that God told them to go to Nineveh to preach, Jonah went, he's going to forgive them. I said, I knew it. I just knew it. You're going to show them mercy. He wasn't happy for all sorts of different reasons. But he knew that when he was sent with the message that if Nineveh didn't repent in 40 days, they'd be overthrown. He knew that it wasn't that, that they would be overthrown secretly in his heart of hearts. He, he was hoping for that. But he knew in the depths of his heart, God's going to show them favor. I wonder what sort of preacher you would think me to be tonight. 
If I was up here telling you that God would be merciful to you, but boy, I don't want them to be merciful to you. God will destroy you if you don't turn from your sin. But I have got this idea and this suspicion in my heart that he's telling you this because he will show you mercy. And I was disappointed. Well, I'm not disappointed tonight that I can say that God is a merciful God. And that he will, if you like, repent. Not that God changes his mind, but the point is this. God conveys this message to you this evening so that you will understand that though it is a serious thing to fall into the hands of the living God, though it is not an empty threat, it, it is not something that you can toy with and take God uh, or treat God lightly and his word lightly and say, it doesn't really matter whether I listen to him or not. If I don't repent, nothing's going to happen. That's not true. Because if you go on in your sin, you will perish. Jesus said it very, very clearly. Except you repent, you will also perish. But here's the, the, the wonderful, blessed truth. If you turn to God, God will withdraw that threat. And instead of punishment, there will be blessing. There will be grace. There will be mercy. There will be kindness. And if you go back in, in Jonah's history... It's wonderful to read in 2 Kings 14 because he was a prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel which was really ungodly. And in the reign of one particularly ungodly king, you know, God delivered that northern kingdom. Not because they did anything. This is a thing that really strikes Jonah and he's a wonderful prophet in many ways. He understands that that northern kingdom didn't seek God. In, in a way that was recognisable, that, that God, purely motivated by his own mercy and grace, his own interest in these people, and this would really encourage the people of God tonight, God delivered Israel at that time, not because they sought God in any proportionate way towards the mercy that they got. In other words, they certainly didn't deserve the mercy in any way at all. But God brought it to them because they were still his covenant people. And therefore he showed them mercy because from him, his side of the bargain, that was the right thing to do. And we don't take advantage of that tonight. We don't presume upon God's mercy and God's goodness. But we can have absolute confidence that God will quickly, and if I can put it this way, easily turn to those who turn to him. God doesn't watch to see people squirm. God's not deplorable and sadistic, saying, well, I'll watch and I'll wait and I'll, I'll see how many tears they shed. I'll see how brokenhearted they are. I'll just turn the screw a little bit more and make them weep a little bit more and they'll really feel what they've done. And boy, I'm going to lay it on thick just so that they can see how bad they have been. No. The moment that somebody turns to the Lord, God turns away from his wrath and his thoughts and his intention and the gifting of God towards him is full of mercy and love and kindness to a degree that cannot be measured. And so the question in your mind tonight is, if I turn to God, what am I going to find? You're going to find one who is gracious and merciful. You're going to find one who is slow to anger. You're going to find one who is of great kindness. You're going to find one who will repent him of the evil that was spoken against you. And therefore, what should you do tonight? What can I encourage you to do this evening? Can I encourage you to turn to the Lord? You've heard this message, you've, you've heard something, failingly on, on my part, no doubt, to adequately tell you about who God is, to encourage you, to induce you, to excite you to turn to God. But can I just say to you, turn to the Lord tonight. Turn to him with all of your heart. Turn away from all the wrong, doing all the sinning. Turn as a sinner 
to God for salvation. Turn as a child of God to God with confession over your sins and your coldness of heart and your backsliding. And expect then from God these blessings because he tells us here that this is how we will encounter him. This is what he will be towards us. And read on in that passage. For whosoever shall call upon the 